Okay, hi. So welcome to the Marine Bio Movie Club. Uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So my name is Taylor. This is Kendra. We are here. We are both marine biologists. Originally pretty good friends from back when Kendra still was living and working here in Hawaii where I live. But we thought this would just be kind of a fun project and thing to work on. Um, something that's a little bit more lighthearted than a lot of the more intense research and conservation information that we share that honestly, at least for me, is kind of wears you down after a while of seeing all the bad things happening in the ocean. So we wanted to kind of do this as a fun way to one, talk to each other now that Kendra's moved, um, but also just to kind of share some marine science knowledge in a more fun and inviting platform. Quick introductions in case you don't already know who we are. My name is Taylor. I am a marine biologist as well as a shark diver, dive master, free diver. Um, I currently live out in Hawaii. I grew up in Florida. Um, my background is mostly in sharks, but I do have kind of generic information as well that I can share in different resources and things that I've been involved in. Um, but Kendra also has a really cool background. So I'll cover more like the shark perspective and then Kendra can talk a lot more about some other stuff as well. Yeah, so I'm Kendra and I'm also a marine biologist, but I live in Vancouver, Canada now, but I got my degree in Hawaii and I was associated with One Ocean. Um, I am more focused on invertebrates and I currently am the marine biologist for PNW Protectors, which is a killer whale conservation project out here in the Salish Sea. Yeah, so lots of fun. Um, and we have plans to discuss lots of different movies. Our list is super long. So um, long. <laughs> both um, like the fun movies like we're doing today, Finding Nemo, um, but also some conservation-based documentaries, research-based documentaries, and kind of sharing both maybe what's true information, what's false information, and also just kind of our general opinions on everything. Um, and so hopefully that something that you guys will be interested in and want to sort of join our little movie club. Um, we're trying to post every other week. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully we can be pretty consistent with that. Yeah, so we're really excited. So today we are going to be discussing Finding Nemo. Um, prepare to have your childhood ruined. <laughs> oh my gosh. I actually, when I was in school, had an assignment to go and watch Finding Nemo and see if there's any discrepancy between like cartoon world and obviously like real life world. And so one, I already did this assignment, so I figured it would be a really easy one to start with. Uh, but it's also a movie that I figured all of you guys have probably seen before. But yeah, so we're going to kind of discuss it today and then yeah, we'll go from there. But just right off the bat, Kendra, do you have any like thoughts, feelings on the movie? Stuff? Oh yeah, grew up watching it. I think it's really, I love the music. It's so soothing. I would, um, I feel like, well, I know. I used to like put on, on the DVD, they had a feature in the extra whatever. You could just put on like ambient music and different like, images or like little videos still like almost like a slideshow yeah and it was like really soothing and now on disney plus they actually have like a three-hour loop of just like underwater scenery of like that's the reef put that so on i put that on before too yeah that's nice yeah i i mean i grew up in orlando so our review of this movie is no shade towards disney i love disney um but there's definitely some things that they didn't necessarily get right to true science. I did hear somewhere that the animators and the like directors and writers of the movie did have to go and take marine science courses, at least for a yeah. little bit. So it's kind of cool that they made them do that. So that way they would have most of the information right. They definitely took some creative liberties when it comes to the storyline and that sort of thing, which is to be expected. It's a child's yeah, cartoon and it's kind of hard to explain dad turning into mom. Um, but yeah, so we weren't that when I was yet. looking up, um, I wanted to look up like the actual species of what Nemo and Marlin were. Mm -hmm. um, so that way I could make sure I was finding like all the correct information because I'm not a clownfish specialist. 
<laughs> but really? I wanted to make <laughs> really <laughs> yeah I don't think I've ever actually even seen them in the wild I've seen the little wrasse here that like when it's a juvenile looks like a clownfish yeah but it's not actually Marlin and Nemo are Amphiron ocellaris clownfish or basically known as the common clownfish or the false percula clownfish um, and the story is based in Great Barrier Reef which pretty obvious um, based on the story but it was, I found it interesting that like the specific species that they are can actually be orange which is like obviously the classic clownfish look but they can also be red brown black depending on where I they are in clownfish. Australia so I thought that was kind of interesting because at least from my understanding I thought they were all different species there's actually about 30 species of clownfish yeah um, that we've discovered fish. so far um and so I didn't realize that those were all, all technically actually the same species, just different colorations. I thought they were different. Yeah, they have different morphs. And then the aquarium trade has created even more complex morphs. Like there's the long fin clownfish, which are so pretty. There's like the snowflake ones that are like white, but almost have like this like blue That's color pretty. on them. I got really into the clownfish aquarium industry at one oh, point. Well, we're going to talk about that too. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I love the movie. I think it's adorable. Even just like in the first, like the first note I have written down is the animation is still so good. <laughs> it is beautiful. Um, and even like Finding Dory went, was better, but it's still that. great. Yeah. Well, I remember watching because I didn't realize, I guess it's not that old of a movie, but it seems like so long ago in my childhood when it like originally came out. I think 2003 is when it was released, depending on what I was looking at. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't realize, I guess, how long ago that was. And in terms of like animation, we've come so far in that small amount of time frame. But honestly, I think the movie still kind of holds up. I was it watching does. it and I was like, yeah. I kind of feel like I'm underwater, like the lighting and everything. They even do like the ripples on the sand, I was noticing. So it was pretty cool to kind of see that they captured the ocean and being underwater so well, even in those earlier stages of animation. Yeah, I love Pixar, so. First and foremost, the probably biggest issue scientifically with Finding Nemo is Marlin and the fact that he technically should no longer be a male clownfish. I mean, Marlin should be turning into a mom, <laughs> the clownfish um, size, female clownfish are much bigger than male clownfish, like about three times bigger. So that's obviously a discrepancy that's not included in the movie. And then yeah. if Marlon's wife dies, usually he would become the Mrs. Clownfish and transition. <laughs> yeah, um, because I learned about this when I was in school, but that's been a few years now. Mm -hmm. um, since I've really studied that mating behavior or that breeding um, component. And so, I think... yeah, I did a little research to make sure that I was looking at the right information. But I actually found that all clownfish show sexual dimorphism in the sense that they're all protandrous, meaning there's normally one big female that has kind of like her harem of males or her group of males. And I found it interesting too, because one of my questions when I was watching the movie was, are only one pair of clownfish able to share an anemone? Like it's portrayed in the movie, right? That's like, yeah. you know, um, and found that that's not technically true. Mm -hmm. There's only one mating pair that will share an anemone, but there could be subsequent other males that will also share that little home. Yeah. But I was looking at it and essentially, the way that the hierarchy works in the clownfish world is you've got one big female. She's obviously the reproductive organ, essentially, of her little group. Um, and then the biggest male is going to be the one that mates with the female. But there can be other males in their little group or in their school that are basically waiting for their turn yep. to become that more dominant male. Um, and typically how that works is when big female passes away biggest male then becomes the biggest female. female and then 
the second biggest male now becomes the mating male. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, we learned about the protandrous fish with the parrotfish since we we're in Hawaii. Because mm-hmm. parrotfish are kind of similar, but it's the females turn into the male, but the oh, males will opposite. have yeah they'll have their harem of um their harem of females and then yeah the like top female turns into the male when it dies yeah i wonder why the anemone fish it's the opposite i don't know know, i might maybe it's size potentially the parrotfish there's not usually their sexual dimorphism isn't size based it's like their color yeah color based but the female's bigger and maybe producing more eggs so it's more of like a physical toll. So she needs a bigger body. Yeah. I I mean, that makes- they're all born male. Yeah. That's the thing too. Um, when they're all like, Nemo siblings all the would have all been Marlon juniors. Yeah. They, he's like, this half will be Coral junior. This half will be Marlon junior. And I'm like, mm, no. they are all, Mar- they are all Marlon junior. And the other thing too, that I was looking at is where they actually put their nests of eggs isn't really what normal clownfish would actually do I guess just based on like the research that I was doing they'll actually lay their eggs close enough to the anemone that the tentacles can still protect the eggs so technically they shouldn't have had to swim so far to protect their babies from the barracuda Disney come on we could have saved so many (laughs) that's definitely like the probably the most obvious I guess yeah if you're like issue with the movie know about it yeah from a scientific perspective I totally understand why they didn't want to bridge that conversation yeah and it kind of defeats the whole purpose of the movie but um it was kind of interesting obviously the other thing too once they hatch they don't stay with mom and dad kind of thing um yeah we were trying to breed our clownfish in the lab but uh and that was definitely daunting, the thought of having up to a thousand baby clownfish in a tank. Yeah, and you had to like make sure they laid in a very particular area because yeah, once they hatch, mom and dad will eat them. Oh. And so like you wanted them to be with mom and d- people like will debate in the trade whether it's better to keep the eggs with mom and dad or once they're laid to start to move them and separate. Mm-hmm. But mom and dad will like well, they mostly dad brood will over. clean and protect. Um but once they start hatching, they're so tiny. Like clownfish fry are so teeny little teeny. Yeah. And then mom and dad will will just eat them because they're like that perfect size of like those little um sea their sea monkeys are what you can feed Brine, clownfish. Kind of. Yeah. And so they'll just go eat them. It doesn't surprise me that even in captivity, the parents will try and eat their young because there's not that parental. They're bond. not usually around their young. Yeah. <laughs> um and the parental bond as well just in fish in general doesn't really exist obviously there's exceptions yeah but for the most part it's most not- fish hatch and they're like on their own already well i guess i didn't really write any other notes um on that first scene when barracuda eats mom <laughs> yeah that's mm. Also, that barracuda is terrifying. Barrac- I yeah, they're more, they were definitely more scary than I feel like. Like they're kind of intense. cartoon was definitely more scary than real life, but they're still kind of creepy. They're in real still life. kind of creepy in real life. There was that one. Actually, this happened on multiple dives, but I think the dive with the with Kalihi the tiger. There was one big one like right by me the oh, entire God, time, Kevin. almost like staying in the same spot. And I was like, can stop. <laughs> Yeah, they're definitely, I think because they're so stationary, they're definitely pretty, like, they're, like, eerie. Yeah, and they just stare. Well, yeah, they they definitely talk about demonizing sharks. Woo, Finding Nemo really demonizes them. They brought it in with a different animal. (laughs) Which I'm, you know, honestly grateful for that they decided to, like, not make it a shark that eats them. They made the sharks kind of fun. Yeah, and we'll get into that, like, later, too. But um, I guess the next kind of thing that we see is Marlin brings Nemo to school, which for the most part, honestly, like this scene is pretty good. Yeah. There are some things that I noticed. Um, The biggest thing, so Mr. Ray is their teacher and he's basically a marine bio teacher. 
Yeah, I like his little song. His song's actually pretty accurate. I looked yeah. up the lyrics because you can kind of hear it, but I was like, I feel like you're missing some things, Mr. Ray. It's actually pretty good. It's really quick. Um, yeah. But he got the zones right. Only thing he didn't mention was Hato Pelagic, but he basically says all the other zones we can't even too see deep to see. Thing. Um, which is true, basically. Yeah. The big issue I have with Mr. Ray is that he's actually a Mrs. Ray. He has no claspers. Yeah. But he does have ample eye of Lorenzini. He's got all the little like freckles. Freckles under his face, like when they bring him in close and you're seeing him talk. But he doesn't have claspers. He also doesn't have gills or siphons. He doesn't need like to breathe. <laughs> any breathing apparatus other than his mouth. And his and he has his eyes. Yeah. Those so, they just have they put the eyes up there, but which is fine. I mean, obviously, like to make a cartoon charismatic and appeal to human viewers, you have to take some liberties with what the character looks like. I was like, you couldn't put claspers on Mr. Ray. Is that no one would probably even see him? It would just make. Is it a G movie? Notice. Is, Finding Nemo rated G. It might be, but I don't think people would notice. Like, are claspers too inappropriate? <laughs> That might have been the route they went. Or like, would that be, because I know there's obviously regulations on, obviously you can't show genitalia in basically any movie other than R. Maybe well, PG-13 in, if you assume. In My Neighbor wait. Totoro, they actually, have you seen My Neighbor Totoro? No. Okay. It's Studio Ghibli movie, but there's like a cat bus. And they show fuzzy balls on the cat bus. And I'm pretty sure that movie is G or PG. So why couldn't Mr. Ray have claspers? So, yeah, and people know what cat balls are. People wouldn't know what claspers are. Yeah. I feel It'd like people would question claspers way less than a pair of hairy cat balls. Yeah, I the, the hairy cat balls were so funny to me. <laughs> Every time I watched that movie, I was like, look at his balls. <laughs> Yeah, his song's good. He's Periphera. I have it pulled up because I like it so much. Periphera, colon, Terata, <laughs> Hydrozoa, Skyphozoa, Anthozoa, Tinafora, Bry- Bryozoa, He actually Molesca. talks about more of the invertebrates than he does about like the vertebrates. Yeah, he just says, like, tuck in the cordata and some fish them. like you and me. <laughs> so he just says like, oh, chordates and then moves on. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Um, I like this song. Yeah, next we get into the butt. <laughs> Nemo touches the butt. And then on the way back in, he gets swiped up by the some divers. divers. And so I think we definitely should talk a little bit about the aquarium trade and what that looks like. Yeah. The movie actually started up I don't remember if I think for the second one they ended up coming out with um, information about particularly the blue tangs and how people should not go by them. Yeah, well, after the movie because the first online. movie kicked up a huge like industry. I was looking online and it stated that basically the movie overnight caused an increase in thirty to forty percent demand for clownfish mm. in the aquarium trade. Well, like kind of. Lo- I mean clownfish are really really well bred yes and that's what i was kind of looking at even then in 2003 when the movie was being introduced they were already captively breeding clownfish and having pretty decent success with it but it also increased the demand for dory who's that blue tang and that's a species that just throughout history we've had a really hard time keeping alive and breeding in captivity so even though more people wanted clownfish at least right after the movie came out and it's still probably if not the one of the it's got to be one of the most popular fish in the aquarium trade even Mm -hmm. now to this day um like 20 bucks to get the a pair or whatever yeah Yeah. no just one you just get one for like 20 bucks red ones are more around 30 Mm -hmm. so they're definitely still in high demand obviously the movie increased that demand but it also increased demand for dory and sadly we don't have the same breeding abilities with that species when they the one of the bigger issue one of the big issues with them is that people 
Well, I mean, the whole aquarium trade, people, saltwater tanks are so hard compared to like a goldfish or a beta. I mean, you should have really good tanks for beta and goldfish, but they can live in like, they can live in a bowl, basically. Yeah, they can. But like with clownfish and with um, blue tanks is they grow pretty big, but that's not what, you know, your pet store will tell you um because they just want you to get the fish just in general a saltwater tank is just harder to maintain just in general it's so much more money there's more material like filters checking like and things can go wrong it from my experience way worse than in a freshwater tank yeah I don't know I used to have a freshwater tank when I was in high school um and eventually just decided that I didn't want to take care of it. Like even that was too, too much yeah. for me, at least yeah. at the time. Um, but I have friends that have been starting up some saltwater tanks and it's taken a lot of trial and error to kind of figure out like exactly what they actually needed in terms of settings for their tank um, yeah. and like pH levels and all that kind of stuff. So definitely just seeing it like from friends trying to maintain their tanks it's definitely something that takes a lot of time to get good at essentially yeah that's getting better but still like anytime like a movie comes out with like an animal in it there's always like oh is it gonna drive up the like that happened with rio with the birds Mm. it's like at our zoo when rio came out people all went and like bought parrots or like little parakeets and then after like and birds are hard to take care of and they live forever birds are if you don't like three-year-olds, don't get a bird. <laughs> You're like, if you yeah. don't like a three-year-old for up to 80 years, don't get a bird. Yeah. Honestly. But yeah, the fish, yeah. Well, then there's like the catching of reef fish and all the different like methods. and. Yeah, and I was looking at it and honestly, it appears that here in the U.S., we're pretty regulated, especially even yeah. here in Hawaii. Like, obviously, there's still people that go out and illegally do it. But in general, we have much better enforcement out here than in a lot of places in continental U.S. and even especially internationally. But I was looking at it and around 86% of the fish that we have in our aquarium trade here in the U.S. were actually imported from places like the Philippines and Indonesia, where they do have some laws and regulations in place, but they're really horribly enforced. Yeah. Yeah. And even then they don't really have that many. So a big point of just like the articles that I was reading was if you are going to start your own aquarium and want to hold fish that you should just do some research and become more educated on the process and the species and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, there's always like local breeders too. That's something that, well, in Hawaii, it's harder because there's, there's way more regulations in general, not even from the trade aspect. Well, not even from like the fish catching, yeah. but in trade, like there's no corals are allowed, Mm -hmm. which was annoying for me because I wanted to do corals in our lab. Um, But yeah, there's all kinds of like regulation and like breeding is super cracked down on as well. Um, But yeah, like there's a ton of like people that will like breed local, like especially clownfish that the clownfish, like like, the, the designer clownfish trade can make quite a bit of money right the long fin clownfish just came on market like a year and a half ago but it had been in circulation and being bred for for like three years yeah they were getting the morph right and from my understanding too they were giving some examples where a lot of it too is also species dependent so there are some like natural wild populations that are doing really well yeah that we have almost like not too many, but like there's no shortage in abundance of certain species. Where if you're catching like it those, ethically, like it's okay. And we're... whereas there's things like the blue tangs or even like our yellow tangs here in Hawaii, where we're seeing really detrimental effects in their wild populations. And so the just from the resources that I was looking at, it seemed like it's not necessarily a hundred percent a horrible, horrible thing to catch wild, depending on how they're doing it, what they're catching, and the regulations that they're following. When yeah, so well, and even maybe like if the fish can breed in captivity or if it's like a goal, because I think that like the aquarium trade is really, really cool in terms of like education, like in your own home having a mm-hmm. tank 
but even just like aquariums in general they all a lot of them source from like wild caught fisheries so that's where it's also hard like hopefully your aquarium is sourcing them (laughs) ethically yeah and I mean too it could be interesting even to see if like what you were saying if they're maybe collecting initially wild caught with the aim and the goal to create a captive bred population yeah because I think that I know like some people don't agree that like it's never okay to keep fish in a tank um but I mean you can get big enough tanks I think it's okay like they can be content it definitely always is dependent on tank size and if you're taking care like any animal yeah like having a too small house for a husky and never taking it on a walk right like there's debate but I think the aquariums can be really awesome and so like I always try to avoid like the demonization of aquarium okay. trade in general yeah. I think there's yeah there's like it can be good or bad of good that can come from it obviously we know that there's bad that can come from it as well yeah and we've already kind of talked about this like on your podcast so if you haven't gone and listened to Kendra's podcast you should just in terms of like sharks in captivity or just our opinions in general on captivity. And I'm sure like in the future, we're planning to cover topics like cetacean captivity, like shark captivity, things like that. Yeah. I thought it was interesting though, in Nemo, how it didn't appear, it obviously, I think they wanted to touch on the topic without like deep diving into it the same way that we are. Mm -hmm. But I found it kind of like interesting that it was an individual catching for their own tank because it was the dentist that went out scuba diving and caught Nemo. Yeah. Um, And I think at one point he did mention something like, oh, I saw this little guy separated from the reef kind of thing. Yeah. He says like human savior behavior. Yeah. But it was like the, the dad was right. There's pictures. You guys took a picture of the big one. Not that they're, they're family species, you know, but yeah. But yeah, so we kind of get to talk a little bit, I guess, about the aquarium trade and sort of what that looks like and more the reality of it versus what you see in the movie. Um, but after this, we finally get to meet Dory, our short-term memory loss fish. <laughs> um, only thing I really have to say about that is there's been studies, there's a myth, you know, there's that common myth that like, oh, goldfish only have a three-second memory or whatever yeah. it is. That's actually never been proven. <laughs> if anything, the opposite has been proven um they've done like with captive fish they've trained them and found that they can remember things for months yeah so I think fish are probably a lot smarter than we give them credit for they're definitely smarter Um, but yeah that's my only thing about Dory otherwise like you know yeah I think it was more like just like a creative funny choice definitely I know one of the big things um is like people say when you said like fish have bad memories people also like oh fish don't feel pain which is also not is true. Also not true at all. Yeah. Fish feel pain. A lot of mis- I mean, yeah, I think just in general, there's a lot of misconception that fish are kind of. But like you just don't, you don't, it's not like your dog where you have next to you and you're like, oh, it's so soft. And they like whimper. A fish can't whimper. Right. Oh, that does. The barracuda did like growl. Oh yeah. They don't do that. that they don't, they don't growl. <laughs> yeah. The noise you hear on reefs is like parrot fish eating coral. Mm-hmm. They aren't growling. <laughs> After we meet Dory, we meet Bruce, who also has no claspers. Mrs. Bruce. <laughs> Mrs. Bruce. Um, and then Mrs. the other two sharks. I think it's Chum and something else. I don't know. I will say the hammerhead shark's mouth makes no sense. Yeah. That it makes no sense. Also, it's pretty obvious that Bruce is a great white and that the other shark, one of the sharks is a Mako shark. It's, I'm assuming it's a great hammerhead, but it's pretty hard to tell. Hammerhead. He's a real, like, generic. He looks weird. He's like not, like, the skinniest cephalofoil. He actually looks like a wingtip. Yeah. Like, how skinny his cephalofoil is. So if you don't know what a cephalofoil is, it's the actual wing that's attached to the front of the head. His and- mouth is as big as his body. <laughs> like as wide <laughs> it just stretches the whole body yeah so the hammer in terms of animation is probably the least accurate he looks like Sid at least from the ice sharks, age if not maybe the whole movie yeah he look from the side i'm just i'm looking him up because he's so weird yeah it's pretty he looks like sid from his ice age cephal- 
That's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> put them side by side they're the same they look the same <laughs> oh my gosh that's funny yeah I don't think they did a great job with him um mainly just because you can't I'm assuming it's a great hammer because I know they have those in Australia I'm sure they yeah. also have some other species but he does not look like what no. a great hammer head should look like but I do appreciate that they made the sharks not just like mindless man eaters. Obviously, they still like the sharks are scary. They eat fish, and eventually we see that bloodlust. Yeah, that bruise. Huge pupils. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No control. Goes after um, Dory, but I did like they were kind of accurate in a way because the sharks didn't care about Dory until she was injured and bleeding. Yeah. So. It's kind of correct. But yeah, because like sharks will roam reefs like all the time and fish aren't like cowering in fear. Right. Because some fish also aren't on the menu. Like realistically, a great white's not going to be hunting down a clownfish. Yeah, for sure. That's like one one goldfish for an entire day. Like that's not sustenance. But I I did appreciate that they weren't just like, immediately the shark shows up like in some other movies and all the animals it's just mean yeah no it was just like you could tell the fish come to my club and have fun (laughs) my uh fish eaters anonymous yeah (laughs) in terms of how sharks are represented just in general honestly in finding Nemo did a pretty good job it's so yeah i think it's super funny and cute well even at the end they come in is there is it an end credit scene or is it the official ending uh, no, I think it's in a credit scene. Yeah. They like come back remember. and they're like, thanks, Dory. Because I remember, yeah. And then they were, everyone's like, <gasps> and they're just like, thank you. And Dory's like, oh, my friends. Yeah. And so it even ends that they're like, fine. Which is They're just nice but, sharks. Yeah. I definitely think that they did a decently good job. Obviously, the hammerhead is messed up looking. Anatomically not quite. And the Mako did have a hook in his nose, which does kind of like speak to that whole human effect. They also, in their little pledge, they say, like, if I eat this fish, may I be chopped up and made into soup, (laughs) which is a little morbid. That's a little. (laughs) For a childhood movie, if you actually know. I don't think I put, I don't think I, I think I just blindly, like, listened to that and did not piece that, which is so, oh my gosh. So, I mean, it is like, obviously, they don't talk about it a lot or in deep extent but they do mention shark that's like a subtle like emo which is like kind of like a tip of the like a subtle like maybe don't do that a little uh shark fin soup reference yeah which is i mean it's obviously awful and sad Mm -hmm. and that's a whole nother thing and i'm sure when we watch some other documentary or something in the future well i think we're gonna notice that a lot of these like kid ones note on conservation issues Mm-hmm. but like in a really like subtle bringing it into like so that you're kind of aware of it but it's not like awareness to it it's just like a yeah and honestly I don't think I've ever noticed that until I watched it this time around I didn't even I just I don't think I even really listened to it I'm just like oh the yeah. pledge like and to be fair too like obviously we are watching it this time more looking for stuff yeah to talk about So I'm sure that that played a big role in being able to catch that stuff, but definitely it's almost like subliminal messaging, you know, like as a child, like this is bad. Shark fin soup is bad. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm sure we're going to cover movies and topics in the future where we actually discuss that more in depth. So we won't go into it now, but yeah, it was kind of, I caught it and I was like, oh, Nemo Dory basically outsmart the sharks. And then they blow up the naval minefield underwater. Um, and I tried to kind of look into this because I was a little bit like, are there really just a bunch of bombs sitting around underwater in Australia? Um, and from what I can tell, they definitely took some creative liberties with that. Yeah. There's a lot of like World War II kind of history related stuff that ties more yeah. into that, which I can't speak on that because I'm not a history buff. I so I figured we would just... Move on. There was a boat in the water. Yep. There was a sub and some bombs and then they blew up. They blew up. Yeah. Pelican farted and they blew up. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure if it was in real life, everything in the surrounding area would be dead. Yeah. 
because that is a they would not have lived that people use where they bomb the ocean basically to kill everything and I feel like a lot of people don't think about sound underwater because we're not underwater a lot but sound is extremely detrimental like in in Hawaii the reason that naval sonar testing was banned and I think it's still banned in some areas is because a couple times I read a book about this it's called breath of a whale but baby humpbacks mothers would abandon them and they would basically just find starving baby humpbacks in like Lahaina Molokini that area of Maui where all the humpbacks are and the moms had already just left because the sound scared them off essentially yeah I mean they still do ram pack Mm -hmm. every other year I think it is yeah which is a whole nother thing, <laughs> but, um, but that's like sonar testing. So bombs a little bit different. Yeah. Different, but like sound effects and, and like the fish being right next to it. Yeah. But you know, makes for a good movie. And it's a great movie. It is how we transfer into our deep ocean scene with our angler fish. Honestly, mm-hmm. this scene's pretty good. I feel like I didn't notice a whole bunch that was like really weird. Yeah. I think uh, maybe like the how bright maybe the light would be from the angler fish and yeah, but I mean but like mm, it's you know. fine. It's funny. I like that scene. Yeah. I think it's funny. Uh, She's like, can you bring the light a little closer? <laughs> Thank so you. Funny. Yeah. Which was I mean, they did a good job animating the angler. He looks pretty realistic. Um, mm-hmm. because they do kind of look scary in real life too, and pretty accurate like showing that they would be attracted to that light as well, just as like normal fish. Um, Yeah, I think that's the most quotable part of the movie for me. Is that part? Yeah, I'm always like, I want to touch it. I think about that when we dive, whenever I'm like, I want to touch it. I want to be your best friend. I think I do that (laughs) in my head or vocally. No, 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 eating fish tonight. We on a diet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a good scene. Um... But yeah, after that, we basically get to the point where they know where they're going, P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney, and they are off on their journey. Um, We're in the dentist. Yeah. And then they get the instructions from the spooling fish. Like, oh, yeah, basically. Um, The biggest issue that I have with that scene moving on to where they're supposed to go through the trench, not above it. That is not a trench. (laughs) <laughs> trenches do not come up from the bottom high trenches <laughs> go down from the bottom so like the scene with the angler fish that's trench. a trench these random mountains well, the trench would be that too deep to see part yes that mrs ray was not talking about earlier <laughs> yeah um this these two pillars that just appeared in the ocean not a trench if yeah I was gonna say if anything it's, it's a just like weird, reef basically yeah but anyway in the movie it's supposedly a trench sure <laughs> um but they're like we should go above the trench well Dory said yeah. we should go through the trench like the fish said Marlon's like I'm not going through the trench I'm going above and so they want to go above and that's where they run into all the jellies squishy my squishy I liked a little squishy. I liked it. Um, bit. I don't actually have a lot of notes about this, other than that's my worst nightmare. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. that'd be off. I mean, and it'd be so bad. Like one would hurt like crazy. You have nowhere to go, and jellyfish like they don't. It's not like you can like just kind of like push them. Like they tend to like stick to you. Yes, because of the because they're almost like hook nematocytes. Yes, so it's not oh, like you're like oh it's shoot just awful. like they're on you. Mm -hmm. continuously just like firing but I mean they did pretty good with the scene and sense of like yep you're right the bell is not going to sting you Mm -hmm. it's just the tentacles um I was kind of surprised because it's Australia they didn't choose to use something like a box jelly box jelly yeah obviously if they got stung by box jelly they would have died immediately Immediately. (laughs) um but yeah, so they did a pretty good job and they were right in that like Marlon would be able to withstand slightly more stinging than Dory because he lives in his little mm-hmm. anemone. But yeah, it seems pretty good mm-hmm. other than the fact that I truly find it horrifying. That's the scariest part. Not the sharks, not the barracuda. Yeah, not, not the, the sharks, jellyfish. not the barracuda, not the jellyfish. diver stealing me out of the ocean. It's the jellyfish for sure. Um, 
than the turtles. Yeah, so we get to green. go through the EAC, the East Australian Current. I have some notes just about the current in general because I was actually curious because obviously like we don't neither of us live in Australia so it's not like we hear about this current all the time yeah um but it is the largest current close to shore in Australia it's a surface current at its max speed it pumps 35 billion meters per second which is insane <laughs> Um, and it basically starts at the South Pacific dry gyre and grabs warm water, bringing it up along the coast. Um, and even though it's not, it's kind of like Hawaiian water where it's warm, but also pretty nutrient poor. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really, the current itself is not very nutritious, but it does cop some upwelling along the coast, which obviously is more nutritious. So yeah. it's still a really important current and is responsible for a lot of the thriving life at the Great Barrier Reef, which is pretty cool. The turtles are adorable. We love crush. Uh, yeah. Turtles are good. Green sea turtle. And everything. They're so cute. You can't see currents. <laughs> yeah, that is one. <laughs> like it and doesn't I don't look know like... If this, oh, this exit here, like a highway. Yeah. I mean, they definitely did that just so that visually you could understand the concept of a current, you know, yeah. without when it made and like it makes the story easier. Like, oh, just exit right here and they just push them off and then yeah, they're in their harbor sure. or no, they're um, with the whale or wherever they need to go. Yeah. They did yeah. definitely make it very highway esque or like, oops, yeah, or like interstate esque, but. Yeah, you can't most, I mean, I'm sure there's places where there's enough visibility contrast or salinity contrast where you maybe can you can kind of see, see where like the that is. weird slick. But looking. if you're just, yeah, but if you're just swimming around, you're not going to all of a sudden look to your right and be like, oh, there's a current. <laughs> just hop in there. Yeah. So that's kind of my biggest thing. Obviously that's super nitty gritty, but yeah. And then they kind of like go and the story of Marlin starts to spread across the ocean um, and they share some little fun facts as they're telling that story. Um, at one point they say something like, he faced three sharks, that's over 48,000 teeth. That's really dramatic. That's a pretty <laughs> high estimation. I didn't actually know the exact numbers, so I looked it up. Um, at any one time, on average, obviously it depends on species, yeah. Can have up to 3,000 teeth at one time. Over their lifetime, they can each have somewhere around 20,000 teeth. So if maybe you were dealing with three sharks over their entire life, lives, can, yeah, sure. But at once, you're probably not dealing with any more than 9,000 teeth. So 48 is a little high. Oh, how rumors spread misinformation. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is like, how long do the turtles live? And Crush, of course, says that he's 150 based on the use of the current and how he was animated. The best guess is that he would be a Pacific green sea turtle. Yeah. From what I could find, we don't know exactly how long they can live. Obviously, it's really difficult to judge that because they migrate across the ocean so much. Um, but our best estimates seem to be somewhere between 60 to 70 years. Well, yeah. And like I doubt that they could be way older than that. No, no. But. Well, it's also hard because for a long time with any species is like, we're going to probably be updating lifespans because we're now starting to track things from birth. But yeah. Eventually Marlin and Dory make it to the Haba. Well, they get swallowed by the whale. Yes. Which is inaccurate. Yes. I mean, that was... it is, I think it's supposed to be a humpback based on how yeah. it was animated. They did the baleen, right? Which I yeah. appreciate. They, Dory, when she's singing, also talks about different dialects, which that I That one's fine. I like cool. that one. She's like, maybe I need to try a different dialect. Rah, you know? Rah. Yeah. And she like, kind of, I, Ellen must have listen to you some whales listen to whale calls because some of those <laughs> sound pretty like accurate. did that sound a bit orca-ish <laughs> yeah um but you're pretty yeah. good for just like imitating but once we're in the whale is when well you know better arises. Than me, so so yeah the whales um 
blowhole is not directly um, connected to the mouth to their mouth because that would cause a lot of issues like drowning and the whales don't just like push water through that obviously like we get the illusion when they breathe there's water that's coming up but that's That's more just on the surface though that they're pushing out of the way right yeah if you're really close to a whale when they exhale you'll get their snot all over you and it smells awful yeah i can imagine but yeah they're not connected so they wouldn't be coming out of the blowhole and that's the biggest thing is the whale's mouth does not directly connect i mean they did the have to kind of get like washed back to the back of the throat before they breathe they'd have to go to the lungs but still okay <laughs> but yeah the and it was like and it's fine it's creative liberty but it's one of those like we're gonna get nitty-gritty and it's like yeah and then kind of the rest of the scenes until we get to the point where marlin finally reunites with nemo are kind of all like at the dentist yeah um, in the pelican mouth yeah and i all the seagulls the dentist, <laughs> so i was you like hate what i do not like the dentist oh okay i have an irrational fear of the dentist so i already didn't like him to begin with <laughs> and then on top of the it i was guy. like i don't like you anyway so um the fact One that thing- he's like holding the fish hostage or you know in the movie yeah one thing with um, Darla is in her picture, she has a goldfish. Mm. And one, I will just note what a dumb dentist giving a girl who couldn't keep a freshwater fish alive in a bag than a saltwater fish. True. Note. Also, then poor parents, because that's going to cost a heck ton of money if whatever. Anyway, yeah. but <laughs> they it sounded like the fish were like that. Was, I forget the, the goldfish's name, but they almost were talking like they had talked to the fish, but if it was a goldfish, it'd be in a different tank. True. They were like, that was that. so-and-so. He was her present last year. There's a theory out there that like all the fish in the tank have some sort of like mental disability or like. Oh, I've seen mental that. Mental disorder thing. Yeah, but you know, I could kind of see because I think they. Hypochondriac have- with the the cleaner yeah rack. so like but that's also it's a cleaner the shrimp rack. is like a hypochondriac flow has like multiple personality disorder um the little purple fish has like ocd because he's like don't touch me he's also a cleaner wrath so it could yeah. be a play on his name um buffer fish like has anger issues has anxiety yeah um bloat who's like the big um porcupine fish has like anger management mm-hmm. kind of thing i don't know like What's the starfish? When they were an- I mean, there you know, there's like some wild Disney fans out there. Who knows if that's just something people really read into? But there was a quote in the movie that said something like, "Being in the tank will change you, man," or like something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you should see what it does to fish, kind of thing. Yeah. Which, you know, was kind of like, obviously, their whole. Well, even the the second movie kind of was playing on the whole captivity issue. Yeah, it's obviously it's- subtle. Yes. And like, clearly the whole plot line is like, we're trying to get back into the ocean kind of yeah. thing. Um, but Gil's the only one that came from the ocean in that guy's tank other than Nemo. Yeah. But that's kind of the movie. The only other thing that I wrote once they're finally reunited in the fishing grounds or whatever, and they're like, everybody swim down. Um, oh. The only thing that I noted is their bottom trawling. And even though it's a pretty bad example of bycatch it does kind of show that when you're bottom trawling or just kind of like trawling in general you're being really non-discriminate about what you're catching yeah clearly they were trying to catch those silver fish and everything in that net was a silver fish except for dory and then eventually nemo yeah but it does kind of show like anything can get swept up when you're doing that yeah but that's like another little subtle Yeah, kind of similar to the finning thing where it's not like a like straight up a very in front of your face. This is an issue, but kind of just like subtly thrown in there. Also, the sewage water treatment is kind of like you constantly see like raw sewage sign, you know, like a Nemo Mm -hmm. eventually gets flushed out kind of thing. But yeah, does mm -hmm. I've always wondered, I feel like I've heard that it's not necessarily true that all drains just lead straight into the ocean. Um how realistic is like yeah it depends on area 
Um, I think one thing I'm just like, I mean, "Mm." all drains eventually lead to the ocean. Yeah. Um, like waste treatment plants, like Nemo could have just also it's fresh water. Yeah. But when you're pumping said gallons of fresh water into the ocean, it like the journey from the, Oh yeah. Down. Right. He He wouldn't have survived very long in the pipes. Um, yeah, the, so I don't know from like personal experience totally because I don't like, I've never really studied it firsthand. Never gone through a toilet um, in the drains. I do know much. like when I went to school in Tampa, Tampa used to be known for having a really piss poor water treatment system. Um, and it's still certain areas, still not great. It's a lot better than what it used to be. We're now at like a tertiary level water treatment, which mm-hmm. is one of the highest levels of water treatment that you can be. Um, and the reason that all kind of ended up changing is because our seagrasses were in such bad decline, partially because of our water quality, because they require sunlight, obviously to photosynthesize. Yeah. So that was kind of the big push to try and get a better water treatment center. Um, but now there's a lot of different filters and things that the water goes through before it's pumped back out into Tampa Bay. Whereas originally, not so much. So I think I don't, in 2003, who knows? Yeah. Especially in Australia, because none, neither of us are there. Um, so I don't know what their local water treatment actually looks like in Sydney. But for all we know, in 2003, it could have been pretty shit. Yeah, that's kind of the movie. Yeah. Um, if those of you guys that are watching think we missed anything or have anything to add, please discuss in the comments. Um, we want this to sort of be like a book club, you know, or we obviously me and Kendra are the people that are talking about it in front of you, but please open that conversation. Talk about your favorite parts of the movie, your least favorite parts of the movie. Did you notice some of the things that we noticed? Um, I will add, I wish in the second one, they followed up with all the tank fish in their bags because <laughs> yeah, they make it, it was left unanswered. In their bag. <laughs> they were just sitting in the, like in the Harbor, like what yeah, now? Actually, I mean, we'll have to do a whole nother review on Finding Dory because it tackles- That one has a whole other plethora of issues. Yeah, tackles a whole different set of issues. Temperature. We'll review that at some point. If that's something you guys want to see, let us know. So that's kind of what we're going to continue to do. I think maybe next time we'll discuss Blackfish. Yes. Um, Which is another obviously very popular thing um, and a lot of issues that we can discuss in that. And so if you want to be able to be up to date and join us in that conversation, make sure you watch that. Um, We're probably going to release this in not next week, but the following week. So keep an eye out. But yeah, welcome to our Marine Bio Movie Club. We're really excited to sort of do this with you guys and have kind of a fun spot where we can discuss different documentaries and movies from that Marine Bio perspective. If you have any movies or anything that you want us to do, Please, by all means, put it in the comments. We've got a really long list already, but open to pretty much any suggestions as well. So let us know. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, it was really good talking to you, Kendra. Thank you you for joining me today. Um, Of course, anytime. But yeah, super fun. So we'll see you guys next time when we discuss Blackfish.